off we go in that case. Yes. Well, the welcome. Hello. <laughs> I just started. Hello. Welcome to the girls uh, and women and autism uh, seminar uh, today. My name's Sarah Hendricks, uh, and I'm going to be delivering this seminar for you today. So the plan for the session that we have, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, who I am uh, professionally, personally, how, how I ended up doing, doing what I do. We're going to talk a little bit about some background around research and diagnosis for girls and women, um, because I'm sure, as many of you are aware, that the, uh, the, the picture, the history, uh, and the knowledge that autism may present differently in females is a fairly recent understanding. We're going to have a look at the female presentation itself and think about how that applies to the diagnostic criteria for autism, the existing diagnostic criteria. The, the general thinking, uh, as far as I'm aware, is that nobody really thinks that we need a brand new criteria for diagnosing women. We just need to learn to apply the existing criteria in a slightly different way, to ask the right questions, to look at certain behaviors perhaps in a slightly different light when it comes to girls, to broaden our understanding of how girls might present, and, and it might be different than, than a, a standard uh, male um, or, or more traditional profile. We'll also have a little look at some of the challenges uh, for, for girls and women academically, teenage years and, and social, uh, and, and have, a, have a little look at some, some strategies uh, for, for support. So what I'm going to talk about today is very much uh, trends. We're, we're not talking about anything definitive. There's no absolutes here. Um, the presentation is varied across all individuals on the autistic spectrum, um, and the impact of that is also uh, varied for, for all individuals. Uh, it's also uh, worth mentioning that this is not binary, because uh, sometimes I, I give these presentations and people say, hey, but I've got a son who presents autism just like that, or I've got a daughter who presents autism in a in a much more traditional way. So it, it, I'm not definitively saying that all girls or all boys experience autism in, in any particular way. This is a generalization of a certain type of, of features uh, and, and, a, and a different kind of, kind of profile. Uh, and we know that it's not just girls and women who are misdiagnosed or, or missed for diagnosis, but the focus of this session is, is more, more on, on females. We also know that gender is not binary and that for a lot of people, male and female identities don't encompass their experience. So I'm going to use the, the, the female uh, terminology, um, but with the understanding that actually we're, we're talking about a whole bunch of people, some of whom don't fit with, within any kind of traditional male-female um, identity or, or, or roles. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, myself uh, as, as we go on. I was diagnosed uh, as autistic a, a few years ago uh, at the age of 43. By the time I was diagnosed, I had a master's degree in autism, six books published uh, about autism. I've delivered well over a thousand training presentations. I was a manager of an autism. We're losing your sound. Project for seven. In the years, I also have a diagnosed autistic partner and a son and, and other, other family members uh, increasingly are, are diagnoses. Am I back? Um, you you cut out there for a little bit and um, hello can you yes I can hear you now we lost you for a bit I we I heard by the time you were diagnosed Do you remember the last thing I said you said by the time you were diagnosed you had a mask okay okay you're disappearing as well now I don't know one oh. of us is maybe I've got some. I've got good net, good internet signal. I don't know why that's doing that. Yes. Um, Am I back? Shall I continue? Yes, you're back. Okay, I'll 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 keep keep trying. Um, by the time I was diagnosed, I, I had a master's degree and, and published books, and as you can see, delivered lots of training sessions. And I was a manager of an autism pro a mentoring project for for seven years, uh, and had family members diagnosed. My son, my partner, also have have diagnoses. 
which sounds a bit crazy that I could be in the field for that length of time and not realize that this applied to me. Um, and I, I guess that just really only goes to show how recent the understanding of, of, of women are. Um, and it took so long purely because of that, that, that all of the people that I were comparing myself to, all of the instruction that I re, uh, received through my training around all autism all presented to me a profile of a person that I didn't really fit. I was aware that I understood it. I was uh, People would come up to me in conferences and say, you must be autistic. There's no way you can talk about autism um, and not be autistic, uh, talk about it in the way that you do and, and not be autistic. Um, and I just thought, well, no, I, I, I don't really fit. Increasingly, I started to meet more and more women through my work who had diagnoses. And increasingly, I started to see that those women were very, very similar to me. We had very similar life histories. Um, and, and the things that we're going to talk about today will, will sort of I hope show how how we this ex expectation of a certain way of being is not necessarily uh, 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 applying. And as we will learn, one of my things that I did was to apply my logical brain to the lifelong study of people rather than objects. Uh, and and the studying of objects, the special interest around objects, is is very much something that we we traditionally associate with, object, with with autism. But what happens if you study people? You get to be very convincing. Uh, you get to be very uh, expert in in understanding how to socialise and how to how to get get on with people. So my life uh, was. I can't move the slides. Here we go. Um, as a child, uh, this is me with my friend uh, Amanda, uh, and Amanda is now the head of an autism unit in a school. So um, Amanda obviously picked her friends well from an, from an early age uh, and, and looked after me kindly at, at Brownies. Um, I was considered to be a gifted child. I had a very high IQ, uh, and apparently I spoke full sentences at nine months old. Um, there were various descriptors made of me, shy, neurotic, in a world of her own, Sarah Snail, because I was always dawdling and, and, and daydreaming. I was very much a tomboy. I liked um, making a um, I liked all the uh, sewing collection. I would uh, organize all of them into, into small small boxes. I was considered to be very clever but lazy. I, I didn't really understand what the purpose of this learning was. Um, I, I was never alone. I always had friends. They tended to be one-to-one, -one, uh, quite intense friendships. Um, and they were often people who were much more socially able than me. So I kind of trotted around um, quite passively uh, after, after each of these individuals. As I moved into teenage years, and as we will uh, learn um, from, from research and, and, and anecdotal evidence later in, in a few minutes, that the teens are really hard for the girls. Uh, it's the point where the um, social relationships change, where they become much more nuanced, they become much more comp uh, complicated, um, and the teenage girls struggle enormously to keep up with their peers. Um, and for me, uh, I was a very naive person. Despite being clever, I didn't have much of a social understanding. Um, and I think this is a very key part to what we often call the, the spiky or uneven profile in autism, is that often this can be somebody who's quite brilliant in certain areas, but actually in other areas where more social or abstract thinking is required, um, we end up with somebody who, who can be unbelievably uh, incapable or awkward or vulnerable or, or naive. I very much wanted to fit in, um, but all of that was a, was a, was a non-intuitive, um, conscious effort. trying to, to work out how, how to do all of that, and the result of which has been a, a lifelong, quite a large degree as a teenager with, with, with alcohol. 
And unsurprisingly, I ended up pregnant by 18. Um, and this picture here is with me with my, my baby daughter, uh, who's now 29. Um, uh, lots of relationships, lots of, uh, a couple of failed marriages, many, many jobs. Um, just a real mishmash of, of how what the, some, somebody who had a, such a good educational profile and it was an expectation that I would be successful, that life would be fairly easy, that, that, that I would achieve uh, very highly um, and none of those things really happened um, because I just didn't really have the, the people skills, the flexibility, um, the anxiety management to, to, to live the kind of life that, that my, my intellectual profile perhaps suggested was, would, would be possible. And so the diagnosis, I mean, some people say, well, why bother being diagnosed in your 40s? You've got that far. What, what's, what's the point? Um, and I think the point, and, and this is certainly an experience shared by most people that I have met who have had a later diagnosis, is, is that suddenly it all makes sense. You, you, it's not an excuse. It doesn't get you out of things, but it, it, it just all makes sense. That you can fit all the pieces in uh, and understand that, that autism explains it all. Uh, it explains why a, a shopping trip for me is, is exhausting after 30 minutes, why I, I'm hot in the air conditioning, I, I, I'm uncomfortable trying to put try clothes on, I, I just want to get away and that other people find that fun, they find it in, in, enjoyable, um, that, that everyday activities are exhausting. If, if I go to work during the day, then that's my day finished. I, I have no hobbies, I, I don't see any friends, I do nothing in the evenings. The, the day of work uh, exhausts um, the capacity that, 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 that I have. Um, it explains the, the multiple relationships and the multiple social difficulties that, that, that I've had. Um, I don't really maintain friends very well, it just doesn't really occur to me to, to contact people. Um, and often I find that I don't, um, I'm not able to make friends well despite my best in efforts. Um, I just don't seem to stick with people. I, I can't explain why that is. I hope I'm not rude or odd or, or particularly uh, inappropriate, but for some reason, it, it's a it's a uh, a truth that that I just wouldn't kind of get the call um, and wouldn't end up on that person's sort of typical friend list. Uh, and, and again, this is something that seems to happen to a to a lot of a lot of people. Um, it also explains that I just don't really. I have this enormously logical brain and I often seem to reach conclusions much more quickly, sometimes months ahead of, of other people um, and, and, and I'm, I'm usually correct uh, purely because I just use logic and I, and I just see things in, in a very particular way um, and so I often end up being right about things. Um, frustratingly because nobody listens and they have to kind of find their own way and, and, and end up there whereas I figure that we could have saved a whole bunch of time if we just believed me in the first place but often people don't seem to, to, to feel that way um, and also I don't talk about handbags I don't do handbags I, I don't I don't have uh, those sort of more female kind of fripperies are just just not not my thing I have a rucksack because it carries my things in it in a practical kind of a way I don't wear makeup I don't really do fashion um, so in, in lots of ways, I think as a, as a, as a woman, there are, there are certain things that, that I just can't participate in because I have no interest, I have nothing to say, um, and, and I just don't know how to give people what they need in, in those sorts of things. And so the diagnosis kind of means that um, I wasn't wrong, I, I was, I was just, just different. The other impact of all of this for me has been a whole bunch of not only sort of mental health kind of things, mainly around anxiety, um, but also uh, a lot of physical ailments. Um, I have tinnitus, I get vertigo, I have headaches, I have migraines, um, sensory issues around light, um, most um, chemicals, um, air fresheners, uh, air conditioning, those sorts of things. Um, quite a lot of foods um, I'm just a, a bit insensitive to. So I think I've just always spent my life uh, and one of the things, uh, one, I, I wrote a book about about women and girls and autism, and one of the things that came up was was how that quite often the women had been accused of being hypochondriacs, that we were perhaps feeling everything uh, that was going on in our bodies, perhaps more stressed, perhaps more more overwhelmed a lot of the time, and, and consistently were having 
health problems and, and just just niggles and, and uh, difficulties with, with with our with our health, uh, and that came up quite quite a lot. So, for me, the autism isn't just a standalone cognitive thing. It it affects my whole uh, physical and mental um, well-being and ability to 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 function in the world in the same way that that everybody else uh, may just uh, take take for granted. So now I leave this very autistic life. Uh, this is me and my partner. The picture was taken about 13 years ago. He looks like he's about 17. He's actually 47. Um, uh, so uh, there is a thing about youthfulness coming with Asperger's. So, so maybe maybe that's uh, that's something that he's been blessed with. I'm not sure that I have. The um, the life that we that I have now, uh, and and the the framework that the diagnosis gives is um, is an ability to create a life which supports the strengths, um, minimizes the effects on, on health and, and well-being, and minimizes on, on, on limitations. Um, my partner's also autistic, and, and that's uh, enormously helpful um, to, to have somebody who has some understanding and some acceptance of, of, uh, of, a, of a world that, that is not necessarily particularly typical. Uh, I live in a very rural, very low in, uh, rousal uh, in, environment. Um, I don't see anyone apart from my partner for, for many days uh, on end. Um, there's no traffic, there's no buildings, there's nothing unnatural that, that, that upsets me on a, on a sensory level. Uh, I also uh, run my own business. I'm an independent trainer, consultant and author in, in autism um, and I manage my own schedule. I also don't have to listen to the authority of other people, which was a big problem for me and hence why I had over 30 jobs um, that, that I don't necessarily uh, see things in the same way that other people do. Um, I'm still working on trying to uh, accept myself and trying to be myself and to try and stop trying to be what everybody else wants me to be and to have some kind of sense of, of self-identity and, and, and acceptance. Um, that's a work in progress and I think for a late diagnosed person having spent over 40 years not knowing why um, you didn't fit and, and, and yet desperately trying to, uh, I, I suspect that will always not necessarily be particularly easy for, for, me, for me to do. I think younger people perhaps might have a better chance of, of achieving that. Um, and I, I think just understanding who I am and what I need uh, allows me to accept elements of myself that I, I like to do things in certain ways. I like to eat the same meal over and over and over again, I, I, and, and that's okay. Uh, and I, I think that's what it's been like. So in the past, um, or actually even, even currently, gender has rarely been considered in autism research. Um, typically in autism studies there have been a group of autistic people, usually children, and a group of non-autistic people, and it may well be that those two groups were compared. Nobody ever thought about um, separating those groups to consider whether male or female autistic children or non-autistic children were behaving or responding in particularly different ways. So, so the autism diagnosis almost kind of um, removed any any potential gender differences um, that often people consider to exist in, in the general population. So what we end up with is that there are very few um, uh, gender separated studies. There are very few women um, within those sample groups uh, because uh, Kanner and Asperger's original work uh, was was, was the, the original work research papers were, were carried out on male children. As the diagnostic criteria have evolved from that initial research, uh, they have changed. But because only male children were being diagnosed for the most part, they've continued to change around a, a kind of more traditional uh, male, if you like, autistic profile. So the sample sizes in any gender research don't get any bigger because there aren't very many women to or girls to to take part in those studies because because they've not been diagnosed and so we end up with this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy with clinicians learning that autism is mainly male because all the research papers are focusing on sample groups that are that are made up mostly of, of, of boys 
And if females don't kind of fit that profile, then the chances are they're just not going to be diagnosed. Plus, the clinicians aren't looking for autism in girls. They're looking for something else. They don't necessarily assume that a girl presented to them with, with a certain features um, would be autistic because their understanding is that the, the girls don't necessarily have, have autism. So we end up with this round and round circle of, of few females being diagnosed and therefore the, diagnos the, the diagnosis and, and the proportion of male to female remaining relatively high. I think at the moment it's considered to be about four to one generally, but people are now thinking, well, maybe more like two to one, um, that, that there are many, many more girls um, out. Oh, can you hear me, Joanne? I can hear you. you you've come out in and out briefly, uh, but it's back now. Okay, is that okay? Am I all right? Am I just, I'm okay you to keep are. going? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. So, female specific diagnostic criteria not considered to be required. Um, the, the recommendation is, is that clinicians are trained better. Um, with girls, often the mental health diagnosis is often given first before an, um, an autism diagnosis. Things like social anxiety disorder, things like OCD are often more readily given to girls. Um, the other, last week I gave a, a conference presentation to a room full of hospital clinicians and psychiatrists um, and, and such um, and presented a bit about myself and a bit about the, the female profile and one of the psychiatrists said um, that if I had turned up in his clinic he would have given me a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder um, and that um, which was very honest of him, um, and that he said that he just didn't have the awareness that, that somebody like me could, could present in this way and, and, and legitimately have an, an autism diagnosis. Um, and I come across this a lot. I've come across a lot of women who have a whole string of mental health um, diagnoses, and, and myself included, um, general anxiety disorder, um, agoraphobia, those sorts of things, um, uh, things that I've been diagnosed with in the past when actually the core of it all um, could be could be autism. Um, so we're seeing that girls are often diagnosed a bit later than boys um, on, on average. Um, uh, in England we have a tool um, called the ADOS, um, and I'm, I don't know if you have that over in the States, but it's considered not to be appropriate as a sole um, diagnostic tool for girls. Um, it's just too coarse, it doesn't pick up enough, and it doesn't make any concession for masking. Uh, it assumes that all of your behaviours you will display during the assessment appointment. And so if you don't, because you've learnt to hide them or you don't want to look different uh, for whatever reason, um, you won't score as being on, on the autistic profile. Um, so. Um, uh, experts, um, uh, including uh, Dr. Judith Gould, who, who was a long-term colleague of Dr. L Lorna Wing, um, suggests that the ADOS is not appropriate for, for being the only tool for, for diagnosis. Uh, Professor Tony Atwood uh, is developing a screening test for girls, um, not a diagnostic criteria, but certainly a list of, of questions and um, which are uh, relate more closely to the things that we're going to be talking about uh, to, today. If you're taking someone female to diagnosis, you must compile as much evidence as you possibly can about how she meets the criteria. Um, you can't just necessarily go along and expect that the, the clinician will be able to uh, ask the right questions or, or suss it out, particularly if she's particularly invisible, um, particularly if she has no learning disability or no intellectual impairment, uh, if she's a, a kind of mainstream child or, or, or adult, um, it, it may be very invisible and it's important that, that we make sure that, that you go fully armed to demonstrate all of the criteria be, being met. Um, and, and that information is easily findable on, on the internet. If you just put kind of Asperger's criteria or diagnostic criteria, autism criteria, you'll, you'll find what you need. Uh, with many examples. Um, the caution for diagnosis, and diagnosis overall is, is extremely beneficial to most people, the, the caution is just to uh, make sure it doesn't limit um, or, or lead to over overprotection. protection <coughs> Excuse me. The research context, um, as I said, it could be, uh, we considered that it's around about the uh, two, point, two, 2 to 1 uh, ratio 
but some people suggest that it could be equal. We may have as many males as females um, on, on the autistic spectrum. Um, uh, girls apparently uh, look less autistic. Uh, these are all features that were picked up in, in different research papers that, that, I, that I looked at. Um, there are a very, very small number of research papers which differentiate autism by gender or which study women and uh, girls solely, um, uh, literally a handful. Um, uh, when I was writing my book, it was enormously hard to find anything new. Uh, all of the papers just end up referring to each other um, and, again, going around and around in, in, in circles. Um, one study looked at when girls were diagnosed, and it was considered that girls were diagnosed around the age of eight and boys around the age of five um, as, a, as an average. Uh, so it was taking longer to, to, to get that diagnosis. There are some suggestions that girls are in some way protected um, neurologically um, and in order to get autism if you are female then, then more has to happen uh, to the structure of your brain uh, in order for, 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 that, for that to be, a, be the case. But this is very new stuff, um, there's a huge amount more un understanding. Some people feel that male and female autism may be actually completely different conditions, um, that are totally, totally separate from, from each other. For girls that uh, didn't have uh, speech delays or uh, any intellectual disability, um, early and precocious speech um, was very common. So, uh, like myself, just people beginning to speak at a very, very young age and having very extensive vocabulary, speaking a great deal um, at, a, at a very young age which can often fool us into thinking that the social understanding is there and the reciprocal communication is there, but actually that might not necessarily be the case. Uh, we're often fooled uh, by the speech ability in, in autistic people, um, which we assume to equate to understanding, uh, which it doesn't necess necessarily. We know that both uh, males and females on the autistic spectrum um, are potentially more androgynous. Um, so again, some, some studies were done looking at sort of testosterone and androgen profiles um, and, and finding uh, that, that it may well be that, that these individuals just didn't really fit into both gender identity, sexuality, um, all of those sorts of things in, in the same way that we, we, we might expect. Um, much higher numbers of, of autistic individuals are considered to be um, non-binary um, non uh, gendered uh, and also uh, their sexuality non non On um, so by the asexual bisexual, uh, polyamorous, uh, transsexual, so a, a whole a whole kind of different realm of, of objective interests than, and that the girls uh, have more social difficulties than the boys. And it may well be that part of that is because the social um, profile of, of female relationships. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if we could just interrupt for a moment. Now. Joanne, can you hear me or have I gone completely? I, I can hear you at the moment, but um, You've, you've come in and out over the last couple slides. I'm wondering if you would mind um, dialing in for it, and um, that way we can just keep a consistent sound. So you, right. wouldn't, have, okay. you wouldn't have to cancel out of anything. Um, all you would do is... Right. Um, I just need to find num. Yes, so if you go to your um, control box, there and where it says mic and speakers, there's also a telephone option. Do you see that? Right. Yeah. So I just click on to.
Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello, Joanne. Hello. So try try using that. And when Hello. You oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Can you, are you, you, can are you calling in? I can call. Yes, I am. I can. Oh, excellent. I hear you very well. Okay. Perfect. And it, there's no there's no um, there's no distance between us. Sounds like you're right next to me. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Will you be able to chop the video or something to get rid of all of these bits and pieces, or is it all going to be out there? It's it's going to be out there, but I'm going to make a note and um, and let our viewers know that there's a couple of points where the audio fades so that they realize it's not their screen. Okay. Fine. So we heard, so on this screen research context, I heard you right where you were saying that males and females with autism are more androgynous, and then it okay. faded. Okay, fine. We'll begin from that point there then. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, males and females with autism are uh, considered to be more um, androgynous. So we, we traditionally talked about males being more, perhaps more feminine, and we've perhaps talked about girls being more tomboyish. Those are, those are some of the terms that people use. Um, scientifically, people are starting to think, well, actually, maybe neither of those things are true, that actually maybe both um, both genders are, are more in the middle, um, um, almost were without gender. Um, and certainly there's been uh, some, some early research and a lot of anecdotal uh, work from individuals who consider them to, to be, um, in terms of their sexuality, in terms of their gender identity, um, other than heterosexual, um, other than male or, or, or female. So we are um, seeing early research that suggests uh, larger numbers of non-heterosexual people in the autistic population um, and also uh, more people who are gay, bisexual, asexual, pansexual, transsexual, um, a whole bunch of interesting stuff uh, around, uh, around gender and sexuality. Um, various reasons for that, potentially um, something around uh, feeling socially connected, picking up those social cues and, and therefore maybe modeling uh, certain gender cues. It may well be if you don't have a great deal of peers or you see the world differently than your peers, then you may not pick up on those cues um, and essentially end up um, being much more of a, a blank slate in terms of your, your, your gender. Uh, certainly people I've spoken to, some of them say, well, I, I don't feel male or female, I just feel like me um, and not really having a, a sense of that in, in terms of a, a, of a social co construct. It's considered that uh, girls are less rigid um, and uh, perhaps have less uh, deep interests uh, than the boys. Um, but the boys have, uh, the girls, sorry, the girls have more social difficulties, which seems contradictory given that often the girls are chatterboxes and often they, they like to, to, to join in. Um, but the, the, the truth is that when female relationships become much more complex in teenage years, that the girls really struggle to, to catch up. Male relationships don't change quite to the same degree in teenage years, uh, and so therefore it's, it's easier for the uh, um, for the boys to carry on, uh, whereas the girls really really start to struggle because female teenage relationships become much more, more nuanced and, and complicated. 
as a, as a general kind of overview, we've often kind of thought about autism as being very much the loner, uh, whereas what we're seeing is that some individuals with, with autism and, and perhaps more, more girls are actually very clingy. Um, they want somebody around them. They're very, very close to their, their mother or their main carer. Um, they're afraid to be alone. Um, and so, so rather than, than choosing solitude, they actually choose to be with someone else who can help them um, and to, 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 feel, to feel safer. Some general kind of uh, brief bits of research. There's been some implications around anorexia being linked to the autistic spectrum, uh, a sharing of uh, weak central coherence, rigidity, perfectionism, low self-esteem and, and low empathy. Some self-harm um, uh, research and, and, and thoughts. Uh, Leanne holiday Willie talks about her experiences of self-harm. For some people, it may well be a means of expressing emotions which they find difficult in a, in a physical way, in a concrete way. So feeling a physical pain uh, is easier to deal with than feeling an emotional pain or an emotional dis discomfort. Another piece uh, which is very, very relevant to, certainly to, to, to my life and, 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 and others uh, similar to me uh, is this, this study that suggests that women on the autistic spectrum have more uh, life events. So rather than um, leading rather risk-averse and, and small lives, which our, our traditional thoughts about autism uh, may, well, may well be, what we, what we end up with are people trying to be proactive, trying to make friends, trying to, to do jobs, but not necessarily having the abstract imagination to make effective decisions, and therefore those decisions often go wrong. Um, and the, the person ends up in, in crisis uh, on, on multiple occasions, um, multiple relationships, multiple jobs, multiple house moves, uh, pregnancies, abortions, perhaps, just, just lots and lots of things. And it doesn't look like autism. We think of autism as being somebody kind of quiet and self-contained, but actually this is somebody who's, who's much more out there uh, and, and trying to, to kind, of, kind of do stuff. Um, but with that, we end up with this, this rather anxious and worrying profile, wanting to get it right, but being aware that perhaps um, she can't because she doesn't have the, the means or the understanding to, to be able to do so. A piece of work by Professor Simon Baron Cohen looked at uh, both autistic women and the mothers of children uh, with, with autism um, and showed a whole bunch of um, essentially testosterone um, androgen uh, profile um, health related uh, con concerns uh, around uh, hirsutism, um, some sexuality related issues, um, menstrual uh, difficulties, polycystic ovaries, um, all of all of those those sorts of things are listed. Um, so, so it's definitely something on a hormonal level, something on a neurological level that, that, that's different uh, about about these uh, this this group of, of of women. All delightful things, as well as having autism, you also get to have all of these lovely health things uh, as as well. Um, not 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 that great. So let's have a look at the criteria. So these uh, subheadings that we're going to see on the next uh, the next few slides are, are all uh, subheadings that are within um, the diagnostic criteria of, of, of autism, essentially. Um, and so I'm just going to have a, a, a say a few words about how the um, how the girls don't necessarily um, obviously fit those criteria, but actually, if we look a little deeper, uh, we find we find that they do. So in terms of social interaction. Um, we know that a lot of the girls are very uh, good at copying and mimicking uh, in order to hide themselves. Um, they're, they're people watchers. They, they're often uh, a little. I've seen little little girls at five or six years of age. They very serious face, not too much social smiling. They sit on the edge of things and they watch. Uh, and they're taking it all in, and they're learning the rules, and they're learning how to to be, how to how to be social, how to how to do all of all of those things. Um, they talk a lot, potentially, uh, and certainly a lot of the girls I, I, I've spoken to, and a lot of the women I've spoken to, said that their that speech was incredibly important. They, they were very very much communicators. Um, so neither of these things necessarily fit with our, our general understanding of what autism looks like. Here we have a very proactive um, copier uh, who is um, who, who's, who's utilizing the skills that she's learning through her observation in order to some degree uh, to, to fit in. Um, but it's quite surface level. So it 
often comes that there's not much depth that she's often confused about what people say and what people do, particularly if it's not clear, if it's not literal, all of the things that we would expect from an autistic person. Um, and yet her outward performance and, and profile, it just doesn't necessarily fit to that, those expectations. In terms of peer relationships, quite often she's either in charge of everything um, or she's passively being bossed about by somebody much more nurturing and, and some, someone much more sociable. The key point is that she's often not alone. Uh, and again, being alone is something that flags up people's concerns uh, about uh, typically an autistic boy, um, whereas the girls seem to, seem to find uh, little, little groups that they can, they can hang on to or the one exclusive friend. Um, so anybody observing that girl in the playground wouldn't see that there was any, any kind of problem there at all. The friend can be a special interest, they can be a real, they want to dress like the friend, speak like the friend, be with the friend all the time and if the friend goes off and makes another friend elsewhere, um, this can be utterly devastating because she just doesn't get it, she doesn't understand why would you want someone else uh, when, when, when you have me. Another uh, feature and certainly this was uh, one of my strategies um, was to become a clown um, because being funny, um, being the centre of attention in a positive way by making people laugh uh, is a way to gain social status. Um, so she might be quirky, she may dress in an unusual way, she's uh, quite a character, this, uh, this, this girl. Um, so uh, again, not necessarily the kind of profile that we would expect uh, traditionally um, from, uh, from an autistic person. In terms of interests, as a very general rule, these are often tend to be more people-based or certainly people-subject-based. So things like history, things like genealogy, things like self-help, things like psychology, animals, celebrities, um, all of those sorts of things are the, the, perhaps a little more typical for, for, for girls and women to, to be um, interested in. Not your trains and your dinosaurs and your facts and figures. They may be facts and figures, but they are about people or they're about the study of, of, of people. I've met a number of women who've become counsellors and therapists and psychologists because they've spent the whole of their lives studying people. They can't necessarily relate to their clients on an intuitive emotional level, but they're very good at understanding what's going on and being able to, to, to work with people on a much more cognitive, logical uh, level. So it's been a life's work for these, these girls and these women to, to work all of this stuff out. This is someone that uh, traditionally we used to talk about boys with Asperger's as being little professors because they knew everything, they'd read encyclopedias and they could quote all these facts. And the girls are often called little psychologists because of this studying, because of this, this watching of, of people. Some, although, are completely the opposite. Some are utterly disinterested in people. They don't notice them. They, they, they have very, very little, uh, little interest in, in, uh, in, in what people are doing and are really baffled to understand why somebody might be uh, doing what they, what they want, what they are doing. The topics appear normal. Uh, and this again is a, a fool uh, to, to, a, to a diagnostician sometimes in, in not seeing the autism, is that all of these things, animals, cats, uh, TV, celebrities, are, are all fairly normal uh, pursuits and interests for, for a girl. But it's the intensity, it's, it's the depth of knowledge that she has, it's, it's the, the talking about it for hours and hours on end, it's, it's the taking up every moment of her, her spare time. That's what differentiates it just from a hobby uh, in, into something which, which might start to fit some of those autistic criteria. In terms of uh, more fixed behaviours around routines, um, often there's some different gender expectations. That, that It may well be that we think that the girls are... Um, so some of these traits in girls are considered to be positive, things like being sensitive, a perfectionist, being particular, being helpful, being sensible. Often this is quite a mature little person uh, as, as, as a child um, and so is often liked by teachers because, because they're not silly, they don't, they don't mess around in the same way that other, other children might of, of the same age. They collect things, they might be very neat, they might be very tidy, they like their rooms organised and their, their space in, in school organised in a very particular way. So we don't necessarily pick up that this might be 
more than just a positive trait. It might actually be a coping strategy that actually she can't function unless these these things are in place. Um, and we we might not necessarily uh, see those those sorts of things um, uh, as necessarily being a, being a problem um, because because they're they're just an extension of of, of a, a nice a nice quiet sensible kind of kind of little girl. Typically, it's considered that boys uh, when uh, faced with something that they can't cope with um, will become uh, externally um, distressed or, or aggressive in some way. And it's considered that girls uh, in the general population as well tend to um, internalize those, those sorts of things. They're more likely to self-harm, they're more likely to become anxious or, or depressed rather than, than be outward and, and aggressive. Uh, in autism, what this means is that we, we often end up with a shutdown rather than a meltdown uh, in some of the girls. So it's not loud, it's not big, it's, it's not anything that flags anyone's attention to a child. Um, this is her just closing herself right down, um, and being silent, not causing any trouble, not alerting anybody to the fact that she's having a problem. Maybe she'll cry, but it will be quiet. Um, the idea of admitting that you can't cope uh, for, for some of these girls is, is devastating. It's, it's failure um, because you ought to be able to cope. Uh, they're perfectionists. They, they need to get things, things right. And so it may well be that behavior at school and behavior at home is very different. That She's holding it together beautifully at school uh, and then she gets home and, and all hell breaks loose because she just can't in, internalize all of this stuff that, that, that's going on. So it's important to recognize that, that these two halves of, of a person's life are connected. Uh, that that in, in order to, just because she's okay at school doesn't mean she's really okay at school. Um, if, if family and parents are saying, look, she's absolutely losing it at home and, and is very distressed, then the school needs to be doing something to, to even that out across the board a little bit more because the, the coping uh, is not is not helpful and is not safe um, and, and healthy over a longer longer period of time. In terms of sense, is again some of these things in a girl we consider to be normal. Uh, if she strokes your hair, if she likes to touch your arm, or if she feels the fabric of your your dress, uh, for a girl that would be okay. For a boy, we might think that was a little bit weird. Um, so again, we 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 write off these behaviours because we don't consider them to be particularly unusual. But it may well be again that it's much more of a sensory need. Um, I met a, a woman the other day who was in her 40s, um, and we talked about sensory behaviours, and she pulled from her pocket a long piece of of very old, grey, knotted and tied and chewed and frayed ribbon um, and she said this is what I have with me all of the time and she rubbed it and she rubbed it on her face and she rubbed it in between her, her fingers but you would never know because you can't see it, it's in her pocket. I would never have known unless she, she showed it to me but the way that she talked about it, it was a very important thing for her to have uh, even, even at the age of uh, 40 with uh, children and a, and a, and a career. Soft toys are also considered to be normal uh, in, in a girl's uh, uh, play um, scenarios. But what we might end up with here uh, are large numbers of um, uh, of toys, identical toys. Maybe they're teddies, maybe they're cats, maybe they're My Little Ponies. They might be lined up, they might be organized. They're not necessarily for playing in an imaginative way. So again, if we ask the question, do you have soft toys? And the answer is yes, that sounds fine. If we ask the question, how many do you have and how do you tell me about how you play with them, then we might start to find out that there might be something different going on for, for the girls with autism uh, and they will explain to you uh, the processes and, and the, the, the characterizations of, of these toys, which, which might come across as, as different. So it's not the subject, it's the intensity that, that, that makes the difference in all of these, these things and, and this is why the girls are often missed. In terms of imagination, uh, traditionally autistic people were not considered to be particularly imaginative. Pretend play wasn't necessarily, it, it's a factor of, of diagnosis, uh, not uh, engaging in pretend play. Uh, from my experience and also anecdotally and, and elsewhere, uh, what we see in, in the girls and the women is that sometimes the, there is an enormous fantasy world. There may be imaginary friends, there may be a whole bunch of characters. Um, I, I met a woman who had over a hundred characters in the world that she inhabited in her head she would go to and, and engage with. Um, it's a better world. They're friends that are reliable, they are friends uh, that are that are safe, they are friends that are not confusing. Um, she wants to engage with something, but if the real world doesn't provide it, 
then it may well be that, that she creates her own world to, to escape from, from the real world, which is painful and difficult. And despite your best efforts, you still quite, quite kind of, kind of get, get right. I've met girls who want to be a cat, um, and, uh, one that wants to that believes that she is a wolf um, and crawls around on the floor and will only be uh, communicated with in, in those ways. There's a tendency possibly to think that there's some kind of delusion or psychosis or serious mental illness, but for some of these girls that's just not the case. It's just a, it's just a place to be which is better and safer. Um, the girl who wanted to be a cat, she was about 17, and she said, well, if I was a cat, people would look after me for the whole of my life. If I'm a human, they don't. They expect me to look after myself. She found the adult world very terrifying, very scary. Um, she dressed in very young clothes. She, she was a very tiny person. She had a very um, high-pitched, much younger voice than her age. She, she easily could have passed for about 12. And actually, that suited her um, to take on that persona of, of being helpless um, because it was too much for her to, to, to manage. Um, she would wear cat ears. She would wear a tail. Um, I, in a sense, it kind of felt that, that that was very much something that she hoped that if she looked like a cat, then perhaps people would, would treat her like one and, and care for her in, in, in that way. Big activity choices for the girls. Uh, reading was huge uh, in, in every, all, the, all the women I've met. Um, reading absolutely enormous, particularly reading fiction, which again is not associated with autism. People talk about autistic people not, not liking fiction, but the girls often love it. They, they love to read about people relationships. Perhaps they learn from those fiction books how to be, how to behave, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, in, enormously uh, valuable for them to, uh, to, to, to pick up on, on, on those things. Um, from, from books, they're almost using them like instruction manuals for, for life. Uh, Lego uh, construction toys were very, very important. Um, coloring, drawing, uh, looking at bugs, being out in nature, climbing trees, um, very much a, a, an outdoorsy uh, kind of a person for, for, a lot, for a lot of the girls. They, they just liked their environment, they liked, they liked the, the world, and often these were, were solitary pursuits. Uh, they were things that they could do alone and that they, they very much in, enjoyed being, doing, doing alone. The challenges for girls are that she doesn't fit anywhere. She doesn't fit with the boys particularly. She doesn't fit with the, with the other girls. Um, Socially, she's trying to mask, she's trying to fit in, she wants to, uh, as, as a general rule. Um, in terms of gender expectations, the gender expectations are that you're socially driven, that you're socially intuitive, that you're intuitively empathic, uh, and that your gender identity is, is very much of a, of a female one, whatever that means with, within your, your culture. Um, and she doesn't necessarily abide by those rules. She doesn't get it. She's logically uh, driven. Um, she's not necessarily socially in, in, intuitive or, or intuitively in, in, empathic and doesn't necessarily feel any need to, to fit to any kind of gender uh, defined boundaries or, or, or rules. She has mental health. Um, statistically, across the autistic spectrum, um, numbers are looking at around 40 to 50 percent of all individuals across the autistic spectrum um, having a significant um, clinical level mental health uh, diagnoses. Uh, and a recent study, uh, which was uh, by Professor Simon Baron Cohen, looked at those, uh, suicidal ideation in autistic adults, um, and the highest number of, of individuals. Um, were autistic females uh, who experienced uh, suicidal ideation and um, suicide attempts. Um, so these are a very, very vulnerable group, despite being appearing outwardly able, outwardly sociable, outwardly capable. Um, the truth is that often you're taking on far too much, this perfectionism, this I can do anything, I have to say yes to everything, because if I say no, it means I can't cope, and that, that doesn't mean that I'm perfect, so I just have to say yes. But the saying yes might be to things that you can't do that aren't within your capability, um, and so therefore the, the mental health element is, is, uh, is, is increased, is exacerbated. Educationally, being clever is not enough. Um, you need social skills to get through life. It doesn't matter how many distinctions or, or A's you get in your, your academic world. If you can't apply that to get a job, to be independent, to travel on a bus, to feed yourself, to look after yourself, um, which are all um, much more flexible skills, uh, much more about shifting attention, much more about recognizing priorities, much more about building social relationships, then you will end up just being a very well-qualified um, 
unemployed person, perhaps someone who still lives with their family or who lives a, a very small life. Um, it, it's important that we don't equate uh, academic intelligence uh, with social intelligence. They're, they're a very different different thing. I certainly delivered a load of um, uh, some, some work uh, to uh, teaching staff, um, the majority of whom um, are, in, uh, are female. Um, and I think, and, and certainly this is this is kind of come from both sides, both from the teaching staff being very honest about the way that they uh, feel about some of these uh, girls that they're teaching, um, but also from the individuals themselves about realizing that they were being treated differently uh, by by female staff. Um, and that there's something about it being a, a, a female female relationship, but that the, the autistic girl wasn't necessarily kind of meeting the needs of, of the teacher. The teachers are often quite social people, they're quite empathic, they're quite nurturing, but they, they, they enjoy uh, the, the social interaction. Uh, and sometimes this, this girl, she's a bit too serious, she, she doesn't kind of play the social game, she, she doesn't flatter the teacher, she, she doesn't kind of um, behave in the same kind of way. Um, some of the women said that that they were um, they were told by their teachers that, that you, you don't have to choose to be different and so they were doing it on purpose it, it just wasn't understood that they that this is who they were or this is how they were they were seen to be deliberately unpleasant or deliberately difficult um, whereas from from the girls perspective that, that absolutely wasn't wasn't the case the vocabulary might be excellent, but it doesn't mean that you can understand what's coming back your way. Being able to speak and construct sentences using your own words, your own language, your own understanding is very different than anticipating a question or, or reading through an exam paper or, or question where the words might be quite rhetorical um, or uh, quite hypothetical about situations or, or being asked to do something which requires those sorts of skills. It may well be that, that this girl can't um, show her potential. She, she can't let people know what she's capable of um, because she can't navigate her way through other people's language uh, that, to, to provide the answers to, to the questions that, uh, that she's being asked because she can't understand the question. She may well have the answer, but if she can't understand the question, she's not going to be able to, to, to give it. All team tasks at school have a social element. You've got to negotiate. You've got to work out who's going to do what. You, you've got to compromise on, on what's to be done and are you good at it or, oh, you know, oh, it's okay, don't worry about me, you do it. There's, there's a whole bunch of game playing around social stuff in, in team tasks uh, and this is not necessarily going to, be, uh, going to be easy for her. She's also a perfectionist. Uh, which means that second best is not good enough and she may well spend far, far too long on certain pieces of work uh, in order to make it perfect, um, way beyond uh, any requirement or necessity um, and therefore um, exhaust herself or cause herself all sorts of uh, untold uh, issues from her own very, very high standards that, that she alone can't necessarily uh, meet. Thinking about friends that she might have um, as parents, carers, professionals, we might need to just keep an eye on some of these friends, particularly as we're moving in towards teenage years. Um, does the friend have a lot of control? Does the friend have agendas? Is there manipulation going on? Is there exploitation going on? The autistic girl tends to be incredibly open-hearted and very straightforward. She doesn't have agendas. She's not trying to get anywhere or do anything she's just being and other people can can very easily um, make her believe things she tends to be quite trusting quite often but if somebody says something she will assume it to be true if somebody says they've run out of bus fare and they need some money she will give them the money she won't assume that maybe that person is lying in order to get the money or has spent their money or, or whatever um, so it's, it's important that just because she has a friend or friends, we couldn't, can't necessarily assume that these are, these are good relationships. But we need to kind of be, be careful, particularly when we're moving into uh, sexual relationships and those sorts of things. That there's a real vulnerability and a, and a danger there for some of these girls who are um, pretty, pretty vulnerable. Um, and again, nothing to do with their intelligence. They might be very, very bright, but, but very vulnerable. Other girls might not be their natural peers. Let's not assume that this girl wants female friends. She may be much more comfortable playing with boys. They're more socially um, 
they're less socially concerned, they're more interested in talking about stuff, things that you do, playing games, being on the internet, not necessarily just talking about, are you my friend, how do I look, those sorts of things which, which uh, traditionally may well uh, be too complicated and, and of no interest uh, to our autistic girl uh, at, at all. She may be late to socially adapt. Um, quite often it seems to be the case that everybody else is moving on towards perhaps seeing um, relationships in a more sexual context. Um, whereas she doesn't, she still wants to play Pokemon, she still wants to play the games and other people will start relating to her differently, she might be completely oblivious to that, she may end up in, in situations which, which she doesn't mean to be in, ended up going to sleep over at boys' houses when she's 15 or 16, not realising that there might be an agenda there. Um, She's just being herself and just doing the things that, that, that she loves um, and, and may be quite happy to do that much, much later than, than other people, maybe not interested in relationships until a, until a later, later age. In terms of the education environment, we need to perhaps think about uh, lighting, where we, where we put her, noise breaks, uh, lunch times, break times are really tough. They are, they are very difficult times for, for this girl to, to, to be, to be uh, in school. Uh, the classroom might be okay, it's fairly structured. Break times, uh, it's, it's not respite, it's more work, it's harder work. Who am I going to sit with? Who's talking to me? What's going on? Coping with the lunchroom, it might be very noisy, very, very echoey. Um, her own high standards, which I kind of mentioned before about this perfectionism, um, and we know the mental health picture is certainly there, and just being exhausted, and an understanding that when she comes home, she's probably done. There's no room for more socializing, more clubs. It's just sit at home, sit on the computer, read, just be in a safe, quiet environment that doesn't overwhelm uh, your your very limited capacity, which has been completely and utterly um, overtaken by by your days uh, in in school. The teenagers, uh, the girls that I that I talked to uh, for my for my book, uh, described them as the worst years of my life. Peering in from the outside, tried to fit in and, and failed. Um, some girls are brilliant. They, they study people, they study fashion, they, they do the whole makeup hair and, and they just become absolutely perfect at it and it becomes a special interest and it, it's amazing. A lot of them just don't. They just don't get it at all. It's uncomfortable. They don't know what to choose. They don't know what to wear. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what the point is. And so quite often we'll just end up in jeans and a, and a, and a hoodie um, and trainers um, not, not really worrying about all of this kind of thing, which makes it difficult to to involve yourself um, to other girls, unless you find your your peer group who are who are kind of similar. Also, puberty, your body's changing, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you grow breast, you have hair, you have periods. It may well be that that these are all things that are very difficult. You might not have a peer group to talk about these things with. You might not have any information uh, about this kind of thing. You just wouldn't have picked it up along along the way. So it's not unusual for for a, a, an autistic girl to to struggle with the concept of having to wear a bra um, because it's uncomfortable on on a sensory level. She doesn't really understand why she needs to. She wouldn't perhaps necessarily realize that maybe people look at you differently uh, once you've developed breasts and you're not wearing a bra. Does that mean that it changes the way that people are? She won't necessarily pick up on those sorts of things. Things like wearing deodorant, things like showering frequently, things like changing your sanitary protection, not necessarily understanding the consequences of all of those things, that if you don't smell too good, then actually people start to talk about you uh, in not a very nice way, and that you can prevent all of those things. This might need to be taught in a much more explicit way than it is with most teenage girls. It really might be a, a proper sit-down lesson. This is exactly what you need to do and when. She may not just pick this stuff up naturally in the same way that, that perhaps that other, other people might. Moving on into sort of adult relationships or teenage and adult relationships, we, we mentioned already about gender identity and sexuality. There may be some confusion, there may be some non-binary kind of uh, stuff, uh, androgynous presentation, how, how, does that, uh, how does that affect people's uh, 
understanding of you and whether they want to be in a relationship with you and certainly perhaps larger numbers of asexual people who have absolutely no interest in any kind of intimate or physical relationship at all and that that's fine for them it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them it doesn't mean they need therapy but actually that's just something that, that they are that they don't have those sensations or feel any any benefit in in having relationships with with, with people very much a no game playing kind of person, might be quite blunt, might be quite straightforward. Um, this might put you in difficult situations if you walk up to people and say, hey, would you like to have sex with me in a very blunt fashion? I certainly know women who've, who've done such things um, culturally that that might not be necessarily acceptable. Uh, and therefore, again, you may get a reputation just for, for stating your, your in a very clear, clear way. For a lot of the girls, there's a lot of personas building up. There's a lot of being somebody else in a social situation, putting on a face, putting on the mask, being something that you need to be in order to be accepted at some level. But it's exhausting and you can't keep it up. If you've done it all day, you need to go home, shut the door and, and turn the mask, take the mask off. Um, and your real self gets lost somewhere in the picture so that you don't actually know who's underneath all of that. You are just a set of adjusting personas for, for different situations. Sensory issues can affect people uh, in terms of relationship. Um, one of the other books I wrote was, uh, was around um, sexual relationships and around 50% of uh, Asperger couples with one partner had, had autism, um, didn't have any intimate sexual relationship uh, whatsoever. So it's not particularly unusual for that to be the case uh, in, in autism relationships. And it could be all sorts of things, it could be touch, smell, noise. Um, some of those are good. There are, there are certainly um, people having very fulfilling sexual relationships within fetish communities, within meeting people online for um, no strings, physical only relationships that, that, are, very, that are very safe and, and, and very fulfilling for, for them. Um, and most of those people are on the autistic spectrum. Um, they're not autistic sites, but it seems to be that, that sometimes there's, there's quite a high proportion of autistic people that, that end up in those communities because what they need on a sensory level they need the pressure or the smell or the or, or the tactile uh, sensory stuff so it's not always negative there, there may well be a positive side to, to, to all of that for a very very small number of uh, women uh, with autism who um, commit sexual offenses um, and typically these um, the offending behavior in women with, with autism appears to fit around people it's where they've been wronged in some way so arson uh, features quite highly uh, stalking not picking up signals not picking up lack of signals revenge behavior and perhaps sort of generally kind of inappropriate social behavior so overstepping sorts of social boundaries all of these kind of offences, they kind of fit within the profile of autism. It's, it's somebody who wants something, doesn't understand why they've not got it, um, and, and therefore takes out their anger and frustration on, on the subject, uh, of, of, on the object of, of their, of their of affection. Um, they're certainly vulnerable to predators, uh, this person on, on the other side. Um, most of the women that I spoke to for, for, for one of the books I wrote uh, had, had certainly had predatory relationships which they'd later realized that were quite abusive and they they really weren't very healthy but at the time they'd sometimes been quite grateful that anybody wanted to be with them because they'd had this this lifelong history of feeling feeling so different the adult women uh still the little psychologist she's not entirely fluent uh, at, at getting on uh, with, with people, still working at it. It's still hard work every single day. Um, there's a big community of adult autistic women on Twitter uh, and on Facebook, uh, in, in groups, um, um, on social media generally. Just a really positive community of people sharing their experiences and, and demonstrating that actually they're just as autistic as they ever were, but they found ways around it, they can laugh at it, they can share it, uh, and that the diagnosis is being enormously positive. A very great sense, and one that I very much share, is, is that it's important to find your tribe uh, and the autistic women's tribe is other autistic women they've often not related to autistic men in the same way but that finding other women has been enormously powerful absolutely huge for them 
they still don't necessarily identify with with the standard neurotypical woman. Still can't talk about handbags and 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 uh, fripperies and fashion and those sorts of things. Might not identify with the, the kind of gender roles uh, about how you walk, how you move, how you behave as 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 a woman that 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 are intrinsic in a lot of people, but often aren't just aren't there for for some or, or autistic women. Often seen as as not particularly approachable. This is this is very much my experience that I'm seen as aloof, scary, standoffish, unappro unapproachable, unfriendly, and none of those things are true. I, I can only assume I just don't make the right number of facial expressions or or something. Um, maybe I'm just observing. Maybe I'm just thinking, trying to work out what to say, how to how to get into the situation. Um, but that that's a universal thing for for many many women is is this idea that that we are um, stuck up or superior in some way. Um, and actually, the women themselves just have no sense of feeling that way at all. They actually feel scared and lost. Um, but how that presents itself externally uh, uh, appears to be something a bit more, uh, a bit more negatively per perceived. We still can't quite meet a lot of the social expectations of what it means to be a woman. We don't necessarily rush over to uh, pick up other people's babies. Uh, we don't necessarily do a lot of interim uh, chit chat and contact uh, with, with friends. We're not texting all day. We're not sending messages all day. We're, we, we don't do a lot of that sort of thing. A lot of people, uh, and again, this is very much my experience, are, are not great at the maintenance, not great at filling in the gaps in between contact. Uh, with with friends and family, um, oh, just just not doesn't just doesn't occur that that contact might be necessary or, or required. We're still blunt. We're, we're still kind of straightforward, um, and society is less forgiving of that in a woman than than it is in 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 a man. If a woman sends a rather blunt and direct email, um, she, she's labelled very different, and if a man uh, does the same thing, quite often. Society assumes that, that men are a little bit more blunt, or they are, uh, you know, not necessarily quite so intuitive. But there are expectations on on a woman that, that actually that is, that is is the case. Parenting is difficult. One of the one of the biggest groups of people being diagnosed now are autistic mothers, um, are women who have had kids and their children are being diagnosed with autism, and now they're realising that actually uh, they may well uh, have that as well. Um, and parenting is difficult for all of the reasons that that, uh, that, that I'm sure you can imagine. Um, the social element, meeting other parents, having to have kids around for tea, um, anticipating danger, safety, having somebody reliant on you all of the time, not being able to escape and have your solitude, just the overwhelming responsibility of having this this person. Uh, and increasingly we're starting to get some, some narratives around, around motherhood. Um, Alana Grant has written a book about pregnancy. She's had six children, I think, and she's written about autism and, and pregnancy. She's, she's an autistic woman uh, herself. Uh, Leanne holiday Willie mentions uh, her relationships with her, with her child in, in, in her books. And the mental health stuff is still there, but they're hidden um, because she's still presenting capable uh, and she's still, she's still hanging in there and uh, uh, trying to, trying to keep, keep it all together. In terms of professional support, what we need to be putting into place um, is making sure that if a diagnosis is necessary, that the information is there. We collect the information, we, we put a big picture together of this person. How does she fit all of the criteria? Enormously important that, that we provide that information to not allow an inexperienced clinician to, to miss something that, that they shouldn't. We might want to question actually the experience of the clinician in understanding girls, particularly adult women, uh, if, if, if that's the, the, the scenario, because a lot of people just really have had very, very little experience of, of diagnosing adults uh, and more so girls and, and women. We also might want to question the appropriateness of the diagnostic tool. What kind of you know, get on Google, get on the forums, ask people, does this work, is this good? There are, there's a lot of expert knowledge out there in parents, in, in autistic adults, um, to, to make sure that if the process is going to be done, then it needs to be done well and it needs to be done accurately. We might need to think about doing some training for the family. There's, there's, uh, again, a lot of family members don't understand that, that, that the girl, uh, it, her autism is, is the, way, the way that it is. 
um, I, I met a, a, a teaching uh, assistant the other day and, and she said that she was working with a family where a son had, had, had been uh, who's quite um, learning disabled and, and, and an autistic and, and had a diagnosis and, and that the girl was very clearly uh, according to this teaching assistant um, uh, potentially autistic but because she was so different than the son she was verbal she was intellectually able and she was female so the family just could not accept that, that this was a possibility so they, all of their their beliefs around autism were very much wrapped up in the profile of their son and they, they were not able to broaden that to encompass the daughter who also may well need support so we've got to put this kind of knowledge out there um, another family I, I worked with, I, they, they came to a training session I ran and, and afterwards one of them said, oh, that all makes sense. I thought it, she was just her, but actually now I understand that, that her being her fits into this diagnosis that she has and, and that is, there are many, many people out there like her. It, it's not just that she's quirky or she's unusual, but actually it, it fits, it, it, all, it all makes sense. We need female specific knowledge. Um, we've got to be careful that we don't assume on that very restricted route about what's male, what's female, but that we broaden our understanding of how autism might look. And specifically around sexual health, we need to make sure that there are very explicit rules being taught. Um, we need mentors, we need people to keep these girls safe. They're proactive and that makes you dangerous because you might want the relationships, you might want the acceptance but you won't necessarily have the skills to protect yourself and to spot people who, who aren't necessarily uh, safe and, and good for you. Uh, so we might need people as a kind of backup uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that there's there to, to let you know, don't do that, that's a really bad idea, this person is not trustworthy. You kind of need a guide, you need a, a navigator to, to, to get, get you through. One of the biggest things I think I always tell this to individuals and to families is don't ever let her compare herself to a neurotypical girl. She will compare herself unfavorably. Um, she will appear far less sociable, um, far less flexible. All of the things that perhaps a lot of girls really want to be, particularly in teenage years, she, if she is comparing herself to someone who's not like her at all, i.e. who doesn't have autism, the chances are that she's, she's going to feel pretty bad about herself. We need to help her find her tribe. Where are the girls that are like her? Where are the clubs? Or, or the boys uh, that, are, that are like her? Where are the clubs? Where are the, where are the games? Where are the other geeky kids hanging out? Those are the people that she's going to be comfortable with. Um, or to women only support groups. Uh, there's, there's lots of books uh, out there, uh, either written by autistic women or written about uh, autistic women. You can see a list uh, at the bottom of the, of the slide here. Um, we mustn't assume anything. You know, she might be bright, logical, clever, whatever, but actually, there is likely to be some kind of social difficulties. She she is one step away from from danger and chaos um, once she becomes an independent woman, because people aren't always as kind as she she assumes them to be. So we don't want to protect her. It may be that she has to make some mistakes, but equally, we want to try and skill her up so that those mistakes are, are, as, are as painless as, as they possibly can be. Um, but we mustn't make any assumptions that, that she knows uh, anything uh, at all uh, about, about this, this kind of stuff. So in generally kind of supporting her, understanding her limitations, we must accept that masking all day takes its toll. We mustn't judge her against her female peers. Don't tell her you're not like so-and-so. Why aren't you more like so-and-so? You need to go out and make more friends. Maybe she doesn't. Maybe she just needs a very small number of friends who are similar to her. That, that, that's what the adult female picture looks like. Uh, autistic adult women don't tend to have billions of friends. They have a small select number. And often those women are quite similar. They, they may not be diagnosed, but they're certainly a similar kind of a, a, a profile. The sensory stuff is real. Um, if she's complaining, if her health uh, is, is bothering her, um, it's not her being fussy, it's not her being a hypochondriac, it may well be um, that there's a, an impact uh, on, on her, her well-being from anxiety, from tiredness, from social toll. Home and her room are sanctuary, they're very important places. You might feel that she spends way too much time up there and want her to come back down. Um, 
and you might need to manage that with some kind of boundaries but certainly she needs to be allowed some space there being alone is the only time that you can take off the mask uh, and, and just be yourself, and that's incredibly important for, for mental health and, and, and real being, well-being. People are often more stressful than they are enjoyable. That's a terrible thing to say, but unfortunately, it's, it's true. Um, loving someone doesn't mean that you can tolerate them for very long periods of time. So if you're going on vacation, if you're going to be around together for a long time in a relationship, in a family, whatever setting that is. Um, where does she get a respite? Can we can we allow her to, to stick those headphones on or, or be away for, for a period of time intermittently uh, to allow her to get that respite? It's not personal. It doesn't mean people don't love you. It just means they just can't cope because no matter how much they love you, you are still a person and a person creates social demands, uh, which may be above uh, what, what, what she can cope with. Being alone is not the same as lonely. Uh, being alone is wonderful. Um, but you can also be alone and then sometimes be lonely too. Uh, and we, we just have to work out what the social level that, that is, is right for her is, is, is acceptable. Uh, it, it's likely to be a lot less than it is for most other people. Uh, and we need to take that into account and not, not make any judge, uh, judgment on that. Interest to the way in to relationships and, and interests. Uh, in engaging her, social stuff, chit chat, fashion may not be of any interest at all. Find out what she loves, learn a bit about it, uh, and that may well be a way to build a better relationship with uh, with this with girl or, or, or this woman. Um, we need to teach her to be herself in a world where often that's disapproved of, and that's quite tough to to, to do that. So building a strong sense of self, allowing her to be good at what she's good at. And letting her know that she's absolutely fine exactly as she is, because that's a message that the world often doesn't give her. It says that actually maybe you're not fine and you need to improve or change in some way. Uh, but the message that we give uh, ought to be one that actually, no, you're not. You're absolutely fine. And just finally, just to kind of end on a, on a more positive note, I suppose, that actually who this person is, is she, she could be incredible. She's not necessarily influenced by peers, by gender, by social constraints. She's often her own person. She's strong, opinionated, determined, capable. She can do anything that she puts her mind to it. Uh, and, and that's important for us to, to recognize that the benefits of autism are, are in that single-mindedness, are in the logic, are in this straightforward way of cutting straight through to the, the core of something. But if we can develop those skills uh, in, in our young women, girls, young women, and, and adult women, um, then actually they can be enormously capable and, and reach the potential that, that, that they clearly have. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop there. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have a number of questions that came in um, that I'd like to cover. The first yep. one is, what are your thoughts on next research steps? to ensure accurate diagnoses for girls? I think we just need more diagnosis um, for girls and probably that the research may well be around how adequately clinicians are trained. Um, so what do people know already? What, what, you know, what, what's the level of understanding in this population and hopefully what that sort of research would, would lead to would be some kind of programs where we are training um, psychiatrists, psychologists and diagnosticians to, to be better at, at doing so. Uh, research itself is, is interesting but for me research needs to lead to some kind of practical, practical changes and it seems to me that the biggest hurdle at the moment is, is the majority is the number of clinicians that are just not recognizing autism in girls um, and that continues to perpetuate um, which I still find incredible that, that that message isn't quite out there that, that everywhere I go when I deliver talks and I deliver training or whatever I am coming in contact with people who uh, who've, who've had um, girls turned away for diagnosis uh, because people just don't understand that this is, this is how it might present itself. Um, so that's what I would like to see. What is the awareness in clinicians and how do we change that? Okay. Um, another question we had is, can you explain um, tactile simulation or lack of tactile simulation to help or harm a person with autism? Um, 
I think the, the, the sensory, if I'm understanding the question right, the, the, the sensory profile of an individual um, is, is very, indiv very individual. And so for some people, tactile stimulation would be welcomed and relaxes people. Uh, I'm sure we know about Temple, Temple Grandin, who has her squeezy machine, who likes that feeling of pressure across the whole of her body but finds it difficult to get that from a human because a human is too variable and the machine is predictable. I also know that there are people who cannot bear any kind of contact. They wear very baggy clothes. They can't bear the feeling of absolutely anything uh, on, on, on their skin. Um, to some degree, people can desensitize themselves to some of these sorts of things. I think the days where we used to hold autistic children who hated being hugged uh, and wrap them up and wrap them up uh, and, and let them scream and scream and scream are mostly gone, this kind of aversion therapy. I think mostly we're quite accepting that some people like sensation and touch and some people don't. Um, in terms of whether it helps or hinders, I, I guess it's really just working out from the individual what what their particular picture and, and, and profile is and whether there is, where is enjoyment. If there are certain things that the person loves, I would advocate putting more of them into their life. If they like sitting in the bath for hours on end because they enjoy the bubbles and the warmth and the, the feeling of water on their skin, then we need to be scheduling that in, that, that bath time shouldn't just be perfunctory for that person. It actually should be a built-in pleasurable activity. Uh, life is not just for managing the difficult bits. It's also for building in the bits that make your life more joyful. Uh, and that's obviously the same for autistic people too. I have no idea if that answers the question, but we'll give that a go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question was, so during your conversation, during your presentation, you talked about your partner, and um, one woman asks if you could elaborate upon that, of your relationship with an autistic man, um, and do you intrinsically understand and adapt to one another, um, and, and more along that lines? Yeah, I think it has, it has a plus and a minus side to it. Um, I, and there was some some research uh, that was that was done that suggested that autistic people were ten or eleven times more likely to have an autistic partner than they were to have a neurotypical partner. Um, so I think that we are naturally drawn to people who are similar to us. All my friends are, are, are on the autistic spectrum, uh, some of them being diagnosed uh, after, after me. So I think that kind of makes sense, that, that there's, there's a similar communication style, there's a similar emotional requirement, um, and that I think being atypical perhaps makes you slightly more accepting of other people who are atypical, even though their atypicality might be quite different to, to yours. So for example, there are things that, that my partner can't tolerate at all, which don't bother me, but because there are things that I can't tolerate at all, I'm very happy and willing to, to accept his, uh, his particular um, peculiarities as being as valid as, as, as mine are. Um, I think there's something about being logical, two logical people together uh, is, is a, very, a very practical way to, to, to live your life. Um, we don't distress each other uh, very, very much, we, we don't confuse each other, we don't play games, there, there's nothing complicated socially going on. Um, neither of us like, uh, we, we like very similar activities, we don't like being around lots of people, so we tend to just be together most of the time. We both like solitude and we don't take that personally. The downside is when things go wrong and that almost becomes the opposite, that it becomes absolutely catastrophically terrible because if we disagree about something, because we are by nature quite rigid, because we are not great at seeing other people's perspectives, um, not great at compromise, um, and generally both think that we're right most of the time, that quite quickly a small disagreement will end up at the brink of our relationship, well, we better split up then, uh, in an astonishingly quick period of time, because at that point we don't have anywhere else to go. We, we, we can't resolve the matter and we can't think up an alternative strategy, so we may as well just separate. Um, and so luckily those things don't happen very often, but when they do, they're dreadful. And, and in those times, I'm really aware of how 
certainly for us, and I can't speak for other people, that our double autism has really screws us over uh, and that we can't get out of these dark places that we find ourselves in. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword probably in, in some ways. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question is, um, I am a 45-year-old woman who believes I fit the female autism profile. What are the benefits versus the harms of getting a diagnosis? Um, the benefits, I, I mean, I'm assuming the individual is um, not requiring, I mean, I, I can't speak for the situation in the, in the U.S., certainly in the U.K., um, Something fell. Um, in the UK, if you are a non-learning disabled, independent, adult person getting a diagnosis, there are very, very limited services available to you. Um, that it would, it would be some counselling or something possibly. And and if you wanted anything more specialist, you would have to pay for it. So in terms of getting anything useful from the diagnosis. Um, there is not a great out there in terms of services. For the main part, the majority of people that I see who seek diagnosis, um, it's self-understanding, it's framework, it's, it's, it's expert opinion. Some people are happy to self-diagnose and don't need anybody else to, to, to kind of validate that for them, but other people would like some kind of professional opinion to say, yeah, actually, you're right, this, this, is, this is who, who you are. Um, and in pretty much 99% of all the people I've met, and I mean, I'm talking probably two or 300 people I've met who, who've gone through this process, um, it's, it's a wonderful, life-changing, emotional experience to know who you are and be able to spend the rest of your life understanding why you do the things that you do and why the things happen to you. In terms of negatives to getting a diagnosis, um, Sometimes family members are not particularly keen. You might think it's a wonderful, life-changing event and your family are very resistant. That can be quite painful. So you might want to think about who you tell once you get the diagnosis. There may be some um, implications around health insurance, travel insurance, driving licenses, things like that. I don't know how the situation is in the US. and You may well want to talk to uh, somebody at A&E who can perhaps answer some of those those questions, uh, whether, whether that's applicable or not. On the whole, it's a wonderful thing to have done, and most people find it so very much so. Excellent. And actually, there is one other question, um, and this is about how do you do? You have any tips on explaining traits and issues to neurotypical friends? Um, I have a friend. And I think my AS tra traits have harmed our relationship. And um, they're looking to be able to go back and, and explain the situation. Okay. I think some of the best way to do it is using a third party. Uh, and that third party, I would suggest, could be a blog post or a YouTube video. Um, which maybe I would select very carefully. There are, there are many, many out there, um, lots and lots of women uh, uh, blogging, lots of, uh, lots of women posting uh, either conference presentations or, or personal presentations on, on, on YouTube. Find something which fits, find something that makes sense that your friends will be able to relate to. Um, perhaps introduce what you've done with a with an email say, or, or, or communication saying you know would, would you mind looking at this I, you know I just I just want you to see I think the problem with trying to do it yourself is that you'll either get tripped up or you won't know what to say and sometimes there are people out there who are much more eloquent in describing our realities than we are um, so I would or a passage in a book even maybe maybe, maybe somebody's written something which really encompasses what, what it is that, that you feel um, I would I would seek some kind of uh, objective third-party information source which describes the problem, describes you, uh, and and see if you can broach it that way. It's a little bit less direct than you having to try and have a conversation that might go all wrong and be very stressful. Okay, excellent. So those are all the questions we have for today. Um, thank you, thank you so much for um, agreeing to re-record this for us. And um, I enjoy your day. We're, we're all set. Thank you. All right. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks. Bye-bye, Joanne. Bye. All right. Goodbye. Bye.